um, and zinc chloride likely formed here through the chemical reaction of, of the roadway salts in conjunction with the zinc plating on the, the assembly screw. Um, basically, though, that, that, that uh, concentration of chemical acted to basically attack the acetal. Um, this also should be noted, um, it's possible to happen with uh, nylon, nylon resins as well. It's also a phenomenon that nylon see. So a recommendation here um, was not to change the, the material of the housing, but rather than change the, the assembly screw. Um, and it's noted that if you're doing that, to make sure that you are uh, also evaluating the, the galvanic effects that are possible with that copper tube. But replacing those should get rid of the issue overall. And we're running out of time, so I'm just going to quick go through the last case study, which is the long-term effect of environmental exposure on elastomer. And this one wasn't so much of a bad material selection, and this happens, and I see this a lot um, in my jet my line of work. It's not always that the material was picked incorrectly. However, if it's not specified correctly on the drawing or poorly specified on the drawing, you could see uh, failures as a result of that, and this is an example of this. Um, these, these, this this uh, part right here is uh, used to connect some um, HVAC uh, units together um, in the Middle East. Um, outside of the, the, the boot or, or band, um, you'll see uh, cracking on the outside, and it'll be uh, perpendicular to the, to the line of stress. And also there was uh, metal bands that were put in place to hold the part on to the um, end component. And there was no cracking apparent underneath these bands, which was which was very um, significant. Taking a closer look at the cracking, um, you can see deep irregular cracks, and you can see that on the outside surface there's a much rougher morphology on the crack surface than towards the inside. So it kind of it looks like degradation has occurred on the outside and is working its way through through the part. Um, looking at an, an SEM. Again, you can see the deep irregular cracks, no evidence of microductility, and you can see some mud cracking going on. Um, and mud cracking is generally observed after a rubber has experienced degradation, and it can be via, via chemical, thermal, or ozone attack. And a, another SEM view of the, the, the fracture surface, you can see the degradation towards the outside. And um, on the inside surface, you see a much more uh, ductile, uh, rubber and it, it looks like tearing as opposed to this, this significant mud cracked um, non-ductile surface. So taking a look at the the failed boot, and they also gave us a new boot, but the, the failed boot basically was consistent with an EPDM rubber but and kale and clay, um, but a SBR rubber was also apparent. Uh, the new boot had a had a calcium carbonate filled SBR rubber um, EPDM could be there as well, but it was blocked uh, in the FKIR via the calcium carbonate. Um, basically, the weight loss profile in the TGA was consistent with a 30% kale and clay filled EPDM uh, SBR blend. Um, basically, the conclusion here is that the deep irregular cracks that were noticed, and along with the mud cracking, were associated with either chemical, thermal, or ozone attack. Uh, in particular, the nature and location of cracking perpendicular to the direction of stress. Um, also, the, the absence of cracking in the mast area further supported that it was ozone. Um, the cause of failure was basically uh, the presence of an SBR within the rubber. Um, the supplier had um, asked for PDM. That's all they had in the drawing was the PDM rubber. And they did get into PDM rubber. However, it was also compounded with an SBR. And the, the presence of the SBR basically acted to lower the materials overall ozone resistance. So the re recommendation here for the customer was to update the drawing and to be more specific about the material requirement. Um, for example, since, you know, EPDM wasn't enough to put down because, it, it, you know, technically it was still EPDM, um, I told him to put down 100% EPDM rubber and then also he could add a ozone resistance requirement so we could actually verify that they're getting supplied the correct thing. Um, Additional requirements could also be added to better specify the mechanical properties, and this would also assist in better material control. Um, so it's often uh, a good idea to, when you're, basically this shows an example of, it's a good idea when you're specifying material on a drawing that you, you, you do a thorough job of it and don't just say, you know, polypropylene or um, polyethylene or EPVM rubber, that you, you, you lay out more specific requirements for that material 
to ensure that it's going to work in your in your product. Okay, I'm ready for questions. Great. If you have any questions at the moment, please press star 8 on your telephone. Okay, I'll move our first question into conference. Hi, yes, your your rating uh, that you had for the chlorine, the 12.5% chlorine test, is that an ASTM test? Um, I believe what that's from a uh, that that is from a uh, a library, basically a library book that has a reference chemical, and basically what they do, I believe, is they expose the the tensile bars um, to uh, the solution for a certain amount of time, and then they they, they visually observe the um, the surface of the material, looking for crack and that kind of thing, and then they do um, ASTM testing on it. To see how much retention, how, many, how much the properties are retained, um, they also probably do the the weight. They measure the weight loss and also, you know, if there's any volume changes as well. Um, I, don't, I can't remember the ASTM test for that, but there is an ASTM test for um, studying the effects of chemical exposure on a material. I I don't remember off the top of my head which one it is, but it basically outlines uh, those types of things, um, what what you can do before and after. Was that data obtained from one of your references? Yes. Yes, it was. Uh huh. Okay. Thank you. It was the uh, the third one down. Okay. Great. I'll move our next question in. Yeah, we just we missed the beginning of the presentation because of some difficulties. We were wondering if the uh, Recording is going to be available afterwards. Uh, there is a recording available after, but that's uh, probably a better conversation for offline. So if you'd like to send me an email at eregan at 4SPE, 4SPE.org, we can talk about that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Do we have any other questions today? If so, please press star 8 on your telephone. Okay, we have another question. From Denmark, I'm uh, particularly interested in the uh, chemical effect. Uh, how often do you use Hansen solubility parameter to uh, uh, know the chemical attack? Um, I don't. I don't use those a lot. I know that they're. That you know, for ESC and stuff like that, they talk about using those parameters. Um, I I find it just I find it easier to actually to, to physically do the testing um, because, for example, um, you know, with ESC, for example, for my little stress cracking, you've got that extra um, additive of the stress that's also playing a part in that. And I don't you know I don't know how well the comparing the solubility parameters will actually you know, give you that information whether or not you're going to see that that, that effect. Because, you know, not only is there straight, you know, straight chemical attack on the material, but there's also um, environmental stress cracking, which is, is more difficult to diagnose, and it's also, you know, play, the, the stress on the material plays a, plays a big factor in that as well. Yeah, you're true that uh, it won't give you a 100% answer, but uh, the minute you use uh, Hansen's solubility parameter, you will immediately locate that uh, chlorine would be uh, a problem with, for instance, uh, polyamide. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to use as uh, the Hanson solubility parameter. But we will see someday might it come up in the internet so we can pick it down easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is harder to find those uh, parameters. I know we got a few books that has some of them in there, but especially for for a specific resin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. It was very useful. 
And thank, thank you for your answer. Thank you. Okay, we don't appear to have any other questions today, so I'd just like to thank Melissa. I'd like to thank everyone again for attending our eLive presentation today. I just want to let everybody know if you'd like a handout of the presentation, except for the case studies, you may uh, download one by pressing the three little white pieces of paper in the top right-hand corner of the screen. The button will say Handouts when you mouse over it. You can have a PDF of the presentation that way. Also, I'll be sending an email with a link to an evaluation form. If you could take a moment to fill out this form, we'd greatly appreciate it. We're very interested in your feedback on our Eli presentations. Please be sure to include future topics you would like to see presented in this format. For more details, please visit our website, www.forestpe.org. Thank you again, and have a great day.